that destroys him. Let's read Esther chapter 3. There's only 15 verses, so we will read all 15. After these events, King Xerxes says, Honored Haman, son of Hamadita, the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down to pay him honor. Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it and to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated, for he had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, the poor, that is the lot or the dice, was cast in the presence of Haman to select a day and month. And the lot fell on the twelfth month, the month of Adar. When Haman said to King Xerxes, There is a certain people dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all other people, and they do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them, and I will give 10,000 talents of silver to the king's administrators for the royal treasury. So the king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of Hamedita, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. Keep the money, the king said to Haman, and do with the people as you please. Then on the thirteenth day of the first month, the royal secretaries were summoned. They wrote out in the script of each province and in the language of each people all Haman's orders to the king's satraps, the governors of the various provinces, and the nobles of the various peoples. These were written in the name of King Xerxes himself and sealed with his own ring. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to de to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on a single day, the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality, so they would be ready for that day. The couriers went out. Spurred on by the king's command, and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink. It seems like they do that quite often. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. May God bless the reading of his word to us this morning. Hate will always destroy the person that controls it. Hate will always destroy the person that controls it. That person will get to the point that all that he or she cares about is destroying the object of his hatred. They don't care about who else gets hurt along in the process. They don't care what they have to do or how they have to do it in order to achieve their goal. They end up caring about nothing but themselves. My first point this morning is this. Those who take a stand against ungodliness will be hated. Those who take a stand against ungodliness will be hated. Now Mordecai refused to bow the knee to Haman. Now it is assumed that Haman bowed to the king, or bowed for the king and other of his high officials, as that would have been custom to do, and they don't mention previously that he wouldn't do it, we didn't do it. But we have to ask the question, why is this 
highlighted. Why is this specifically highlighted when it comes to Haman? Now if you do some digging to see what the relationship was, or if there even was a relationship, you'll notice that the author highlights who Haman is on more than one occasion. And you know that when the author does that, when we find that in Scripture, we know there's a reason for it. And so I took that as my cue and I went searching for the reason. Why is Haman mentioned? Haman, the son of Hamedata, the Agagite, twice in this short passage. Now Agag was king of the Amalekites in the days of King Saul. And there is quite some history there. The Amalekites, were the, one, the Amalekites were the ones who threatened Israel on their journey from Egypt. Remember the, the, the Israelites fled from Egypt and they were on their way to the promised land. And the Amalekites were one of the nations who threatened Israel when they were at their weakest. We see their name pop up again with Moses and with Joshua. And also we see with Saul. Saul was actually instructed by God to blot out the name of Amalek from under the heaven. And for some reason, Scripture doesn't say why. If you read Exodus and Deuteronomy, you'll see that instruction coming to play. Um, and I think First Samuel as well. And it doesn't say why Saul disobeys, but for some reason Saul disobeys. He, left, he leaves a small group of Amalekites who he didn't destroy. Now, Mordecai is from the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin was Saul's tribe. Do you see where those two come in play now? Saul's disobedience, we see that that Mordecai, coming from that tribe, knowing the disobedience that took place, also knowing who the Amalekites were, and knowing that Haman was an Agagite, who is from the Amalekites, we see and understand why Mordecai does not want to bow down to this man. Because the very nature of the Amalekites... The very nature of who they are is associated with vicious enmity against God's people. The very sight of an Amalekite would remind an Israelite from the older generation who would have traveled, who would have heard the stories, would remind them immediately that this is the people who tried to destroy God's people. You see, one could say that Mordecai took a stand against ungodliness, not so much against Haman. Although Haman was the one who, who produced this ungodliness. Mordecai took a stand against ungodliness. He knew the history of the Amalekites. He knew that they were against God's people. So he decided to take a stand. And true to his history, if you look at the Amalekite story, Haman completely loses his cool. The Amalekiteness shines through very strong. If you look at the history of the Amalekites and you see how Haman reacts. You see, he's not just going to punish Mordecai. I'm going to take this one step further. Who does this Mordecai think he is? I'm not going to just destroy the man who refuses to bow down to me, but I am going to destroy all the Jews. You see, that is exactly what the Amalekites wanted to do. And he says, what my predecessors couldn't do, I am going to do. I am going to destroy the Jews. You see... How this hatred has taken over control of his life. How this hatred, because of one person, extends to an entire nation. Hatred makes us, makes what we see very unclear, very blurred. We don't care what happens, we don't care who is involved, we just want to have our way. You see, it doesn't even matter if you're guilty or not. If hatred is evident, 
everything you do or say will seem wrong to the person. It doesn't matter if you ask for forgiveness. It doesn't matter if you try and explain your case. By that time it's too late. Hatred has taken control. And the sad thing is we see it still visible today. We see it in our country. We see it in our nation. We see it in our world where hatred takes control. And it's sad to say that we see even a little bit of Haman in the lives of believers today. Where we want what we want. Where we don't agree with other people. We will shun them. We will show hatred towards them. We do it kindly. Because we are Christians after all. But the heart is still there. This should not be the case. Hatred should not be evident in the lives of believers. Secondly, hatred will say or do anything to disqualify you, to endanger you, and to misrepresent you. Just listen to verse 8 once again. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, There is a certain people dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. In Cape Town we would say they are sturdy. Their customs are different from those of all the other people and they do not obey the king's laws. One person didn't bow down. All the Jews did not obey the laws. Can you see how he twists what is actually taking place here? Mordecai was the only one mentioned who did not bow. But all the people that come from that town are uh, from that tribe are disobedient to the king and his commands. And listen to this. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. You can see he's got an agenda. Just look how sly Haman is. He doesn't mention Mordecai's name. In fear that the king might recognize the name of the person who had saved him. Remember last week we ended chapter 2 where Mordecai heard uh, of the two um, officials or two of the, the, the army men, whatever they were called now again. But he heard the two of them um, wanting to assassinate, assassinate the king. And so Mordecai tells Esther, Esther tells the king, and Esther also tells the king that it was Mordecai. So she gives him credit, and I told last week that, that sometimes doing good does not get rewarded. Mordecai wasn't rewarded for doing good, for saying good, for saying the life, saving the life of the king. But that is coming. I think chapter 4 we'll see that take place. But in any case, so Haman does not mention Mordecai's name in fear that the king might recognize the name. Because the king had just forgotten, you know how we are, sometimes we forget something. And somebody says something, all of a sudden that word that they mentioned just triggers a memory and said, Oh my word, I forgot to do this or I forgot to. And in tradition, Mordecai would have been elevated because of what he had done for the king. But the king had forgotten for a moment. So Haman is very sly. He tiptoes around the subject to entice the king. And he had learned exactly which buttons to press to get his way with the king. You know what to do. You know your, your, your children. They know how to get around your little finger. And before you know it, you're doing things that you said no a while ago and you're already caught in that trap. He even throws in an offer to give 10,000 talents of silver, informing the king that it didn't even have to cost him anything. I'm going to pay for this. I'll pay the 10,000 talents that it would cost for all of this to go out, for the news to go out, for, for the subtracts to be informed, and then all of the important people to get the message. Do you see how all the Jews became guilty by association? One man was disobedient to the king. All the Jews became guilty because of association. Mordecai was the only one mentioned who did not bow down, but everybody else was made guilty with that. Doesn't that happen often? All you Christians are the same. Because one person might have said something wrong or did something wrong. 
or maybe didn't show as much kindness as they should. But we are all the same. We are all labeled under the same banner. You see, when people have something against you, even if you are innocent, even if they have conjured up stuff and made you look bad and saying that you are goody two-shoes, they will do everything possible to misrepresent you, to make you look bad. Now, deep down, I believe that these people know that what you're doing is right. But listen to this. Because of your, because the fact that your rightness affects or offends their wrongness, they want you out of the way so that they can do, continue to do the things that they are doing without the guilt that they perceive every time they see you. You know when somebody is doing right, doing something right, saying something right, and it offends you because you're doing something wrong. You want to get out of their presence so you can continue to do what is wrong without feeling guilty. And this is what is happening here. Thirdly, some will be swayed, but the city will be bewildered. We are going to hope that ESCOM is a little bit late. Some will be swayed, but the city will be bewildered. Now Haman goes to these elaborate lengths just because his ego was hurt. Well, yes and no. Remember that God's name is not mentioned anywhere in the book of Esther. But we see God's activities at work. We see God's hand at work throughout the book, orchestrating things for a purpose. And we'll get to see the purposes of this conniving plans in the next chapter or so. But Haman goes to great lengths to get rid of Mordecai and the Jews. He speaks to the king, who is probably sitting there with a dirty chai martini, already like a varam. He issues a decree with the authority of the king, even though if you read carefully, the king wasn't really paying much attention. He wasn't paying notice to what Mordecai was, uh, to what Haman was actually asking. He just says, oh, just do what you want to do. Here's my ring. Go and do it. Keep the money. He summons the royal secretaries who wrote the script in all the various languages, sends these messages to the satraps, the governors, and the nobles, all because he wants his way. He wants to prove his authority. What must happen to Mordecai and the Jews? They must be destroyed, they must be killed, they must be annihilated, and all of the goods must be plundered. Not just the men, not just Mordecai, the women, the children, everything. Now it doesn't say how these satraps, governors, and nobles react. But the passage does say, the very last few words says, that the city of Susa was bewildered. Bewildered means they were confused, they were perplexed, they were stunned that such a harsh, unwarranted law would go out without justifiable cause. The people aren't dumb. They know something is happening, something is going on behind the scenes that the king would make such a law. Maybe they were concerned, what if we are next? Remember there was a lot of scattered people in that place at that time. Now I firmly believe deep down every single individual knows the difference between wrong and right. We all know what is wrong. We all know what is right. Now the world has perfected ways to twist that and to suit their requirements or rather to suit their conscience. The city knew that this was not right. They might not have followed the ways of God, but they still knew that something wasn't right with this law. And this simply did not sit well with them. In closing, what can we learn from this passage? Firstly, the world is full of Hamans. People who are driven by feeding themselves, by feeding the self. They are self ish, self-absorbed, self-seeking, self-loving, self-obsessed, self-regarding, self-interested, self-serving, and all the other self-eds and ings. 
two things that we need to do. We need to watch out for them. And we need to make sure that we do not become like them. Watch out for them. Be careful. Observe them. And be wise. And secondly, don't become like that. Don't become the person that only wants for himself. That if self is not being met or being filled or being um, seen as important, we go out of our way to, to make sure that people see us and recognize us for who we are. Secondly, the world does not have enough Mordecai's. The world is full of Hamans. The world does not have enough Mordecai's. People who are willing to stand for God no matter what. No matter what the work people say, if they exclude you from things. No matter what your family says, if they exclude you from gatherings because he's going to pray around the table and he's going to speak all righteous things and talk about God and we want to have our, our drink in peace without being judged. One thing that stands out about Mordecai's character is this. He didn't run back and change his mind. How often do we hear, if we hear, oh my word, I'm going to be in trouble. Let's say, okay, what can I do to, to solve this problem? Maybe I must go and apologize. and Maybe I must say, okay, I was a bit oversensitive. Or maybe I should have just ignored it. or Not Mordecai. He doesn't run back to change his mind, even though the threat was real. And the threat was very real. It, just, it didn't just impact him. It impacted all the Jews. The threat was so real, it, placed on, it was placed on all the people of God. But Mordecai was unwavering. Mordecai was steadfast. Mordecai was unwilling to turn his back on God in favor of man. We need more qualities of Mordecai in our lives. And so I'm going to end with this. Even though we are saved, even though we are children of God, there are times... When Haman's character can be seen in us. We need to guard our hearts against such things. We cannot afford to fall in the world's traps. Because they are watching us and waiting for us to fall. And you know what happens when you fall? Everybody jumps on top of the bandwagon. I don't know if you did this at school. We did it. And maybe that's why I got problems with my ribs and stuff. Somebody fell, what's the first thing they shouted? Hoopili! Hoopili! And everybody was on top of you. And because I was short and fat, I was the first one to fall. <laughs> I'm not so short, but I'm still fat. <laughs> we need to guard our hearts against these things. I want to ask us in closing these questions. What are you going to be? Who are you going to be? How are you going to be? Are you going to be Haman-ish, following the ways of the world and what the world prescribes? Are you going to be Mordecai-ish, following God's ways and what God prescribes? Or even worse, are you going to be Xerxes-ish, and that's simply just being indifferent? Sitting there, allowing things to happen. Be, do what you want. Say what you want. I don't care. doesn't affect me. That's sometimes a more dangerous place to be. Because we think we are okay. We think, I didn't do it. But the fact that I didn't stand up against it means that I can be associated with those who did it. Are we going to follow the world? Are we going to follow God? Or are we just going to lift up our shoulders and say, what must be, must be. Okay, Sarah. That's my notes. And the lights are still on. Does that mean I must do another chapter quickly? <laughs> now, in all seriousness, you know, we need to look and recognize these characteristics not just in the world, but in ourselves. 
Because we can often fall prey to that. We can often have some of these qualities in our lives. And that is no good. As children of God, we need to turn our backs to the things of the world. Yes, we are in the world, as I said last week. We are God's chosen people, but we are in the world. The world is all around us. People do and say things all around us. Sometimes that puts us in a dangerous place, but it also puts us in a place where we can stand like Mordecai does. We can make a stand. We can open our mouths. We can go against the flow. What is that? Salmons. They swim against the water. Be a salmon. <laughs> go against what the world does. Be different. And you'll see that people will often follow different because they realize there's something good happening in this person's life. There's something different happening in this person's life. There's something that I recognize in this person's life that I want to have in my life. We need to be like Mordecai. We need to stand. And I'm not saying the decisions and behavior were the best, because we saw in chapter 1 and 2 they made some questionable decisions. So we're not looking at the characteristics but we're looking at what they did for God and how they stood for God. We need to be the same. We need to live for God. We need to honor God. And we need to guard our hearts that we do not look and become like the people of the world. Amen.